Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Matias, and welcome to the uh, how avoiding optimization impacts patient care, but it could also be a barrier to improving quality of care and impacting potential, potential revenue streams. My name is Becky Matias, and I'm a senior consultant here at Galen Healthcare Solutions. I've worked in healthcare for 25 years in various roles, with the last seven years of focus being primarily Allscripts um, TouchWorks modules, as well as Meaningful Use 1 and 2. Joining me today is Christy Erickson. Christy, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, Becky, thanks so much. I'm glad to be here today, honored to present. Uh, I, like Becky, have 24 years in healthcare, uh, in direct patient care for the first part of that, in delivery of a variety of settings, both inpatient, outpatient, ambulatory, home health, and hospice, uh, as a nurse and nurse practitioner. And about 10 years ago, I switched into healthcare IT, and I spent that uh, both working at Old Scripps, working at Galen for four and a half years, and other EMR companies as well. So my role at Galen today is a principal consultant, and I do a, a lot of high-level strategic planning, project management. I can do anything from a configuration aspect. So sort of a all-in-one jack of trades of everything, and I'm happy to present and share my experience of optimization as well as present a client success story today. Thanks, Christy. So welcome to today's webcast. Um, we have a lot of information to share with you today, and we expect our presentation to run for the full hour and a half. Um, we're going to have an hour of presentation time with 30 minutes of time devoted to open questions and answers. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, your phones have been muted, so if questions arise during the webcast, you can submit them in the chat area that you see in the red box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and all questions and answers submitted will be posted along with the pre presentation slides um, out on our public wiki next week. So our agenda for today talks, we're going to define optimization, um, we're going to talk about the Galen methodology and our approach, and Christy's going to share um, some tips and tricks about how developing um, metrics. We have com some common areas of focus, and Christy's also going to talk about some real-life applications, and we'll close it out with um, increased revenue opportunity. So let's begin with the basic definition for optimization. Webster's Dictionary defines it as the act, the process, or methodology for making something such as a design, a system, or a decision as fully perfect, functional, or effective as possible. Now, I didn't like to use, I didn't used to like this word optimization. It was one of those words that was really all-encompassing, um, whose breadth and depth was just too large to imagine, much less execute effectively. And it can also represent many differing goals depending on the audience. In the past, optimization was really aimed at the end user satisfaction and reducing the number of clicks so that they'd like it better. Um, however, while improving end user experience is always an element that we consider, Optimization has really evolved into increasing patient safety, um, improving outcomes, and quite frankly, increasing revenue through workflow efficiency and opening as avenues for those alternative payment models um, that Christy's going to talk about a little bit later on. Now, we here at Galen, we understand the challenges of this word. One of our proven approaches that we're sharing with you today involves collaborating with clients to create project plans that are more incremental in nature aiming for achievable goals. Now, we'll get into those details in just a moment, but first of all, I'd like to po pose a poll question. Um, we want to get an idea of our audience today so that we can offer as many relevant elements as possible. Sorry, guys, I've lost my poll question. Becky, you should just have to go to your panel and launch it from there. Yeah, I'm looking for my panel. I just can't find my panel. If you can, I can launch it for you. Thank you. Do you need me to this do that for you? Been. Nope, I have okay. it. Sorry about that, guys. 
So I'm going to go ahead and open the poll. Um, we'd like to know what your biggest challenge has been in your organization. Have you found it more to be limited resources or the rapidly changing healthcare environment, a, a general lack of support towards optimization exercises, or is it some other challenge that you have? And I'm just watching the answers roll in. I just want to give you a couple of minutes to, um, to provide those answers. And Christy, it looks like um, uh, one of the biggest challenges is limited resources as well as the rapidly changing um, healthcare landscape. All right. So let's talk about the Galen methodology. Our first step is really the dis discovery process. So one of the most challenging aspects of any project, um, but especially an optimization project, is breaking it down into achieve actionable parts. You have to keep in mind my earlier point that depending on the audience, typically there will be many differing opinions as to what the need really is. For example, providers may want to reduce clicks or streamline a workflow, while compliance may want to add clicks to capture additional data elements for reporting purposes. Now, these two ideas on the surface may seem at the opposite ends of the spectrum, and it is during the discovery phase that you want to make sure that all the stakeholders are involved in the conversations. This is where the key parties have a, a chance to, to put their voice into the process, and it really lays the groundwork for future, co future cooperation and buy-in. Now, if this is your first optimization project, it may be a good strategy to look for what we call the easy wins. And easy wins are the small tweaks you can make to the system um, that, will, that you can achieve pretty quickly. Now, focusing these, on these early on in the project helps to build trust. And implementing these easy wins are a great way to also test the communication processes. The second step is to develop um, your project plan and your approach. Now, this is the time where it's decided on, on what the goals are going to be and how you're going to measure them. Now, Christy's going to talk about metrics and benchmarking in detail a little bit later in the presentation. This is also the time after listening to the different needs of the during the discovery that the team vets all the ideas and tries to find that commonality that meets multiple stakeholder needs. Then we move on to adaptive execution. Now this can be as simple as a project workbook where goals are chosen and the tasks to meet those goals are listed in the order they should occur. Um, there will also be space for the agreed upon metrics, the deliverables, deadlines, assigned, uh, the assigned um, stakeholders, et cetera. It can also be more complex using project management software to track everything. Either way, adaptive execution is the documentation of the process, and it helps keep the project on track. Now, that's not to say that project timelines are inflexible. Um, any of us who have done projects know that that's really not the case. But it mitigates the risk of failure, and it plots out the path. Now, for example, the organization could be involved in acquisitions and a certain task is set up for onboarding new practice and, and that exists. So perhaps optimization affects how this is going to be handled in the future. And it's much easier to repeat that process if that documentation is available. I really can't tell you how many times I've worked for an organization where maybe there's not a lot of structure and where people really wear a lot more than one hat and the knowledge is held within someone's head rather than a, in, a, in a central place for everyone. And this really impedes the process, and it puts the facility at risk. A little time spent on this step saves a lot of time in the future. The activation phase is where all of the planning is put to the test. Even well thought out plans will have their challenges, and it's during this time that the benchmarking and the metrics come into play. Now, often the challenge here is what I refer to as the grain of salt in the report. Often reporting requires in-depth knowledge of workflows and sometimes of the end users themselves. For example, let's say you're watching the life cycle of tasks, hoping to develop faster times to improve patient satisfaction and maybe patient compliance. 
Now you see how I slid that in there, and that could meet two different stakeholder goals. Now perhaps you're just looking at the data for specialty, and you notice that on certain days, the numbers are drastically different. It may be at this point that you decide benchmarking individuals may be required to further assess the issue. Now perhaps one user has a phenomenal completion time, while another never closes tasks. These kinds of anomalies are a tough part of the activation phase. And it may be during this phase that tweaking of workflows start to happen. It's also about taking the data, finding those grains of salt, and then mitigating those circumstances to meet the goal. Now, it's key to have resources on the project that can ferret out that information as to why a certain number may be skewed. And it's during this phase that interventions can be applied. Piloting optimization on a smaller scale is a good approach to work out these nuances of the activation. And finally, we have the operations phase. This is where we have our plan for support. Sometimes this is a, it's a step that's forgotten and it's not executed. Now, perhaps once the hurdle of activation is achieved, everyone thinks, okay, now we've changed. Um, and what's important to remember here is that we're really talking about human behavior. And change really needs to have a longer-term accountability. And remember, changes are for the long term. And in the example of task completion time, this support can be as simple as monthly bench, a monthly bench um, marking report for your office managers. And if a provider falls percent below a certain agreed percentage, then a plan of correction would need to be submitted. Um, another way that you could do this is just sharing the numbers department-wide. It's a way to, to provide some positive pre peer pressure to the end users. There are many ways to put in seamless plans that keep these interventions in place, and it's often during the support phase that discovering all of those nuances that work for your organization um, will, will happen. This is a kind of a passionate subject for me. I, I've really seen a lot of different scenarios on when it comes to government, governance and change control from no change control process to a governance that is so cumbersome that it can hinder the project. Now, early on in the discovery, it's advisable to discuss this with all of the stakeholders. First of all, talk about the current process. Um, for example, if the government board re governance board meets once per month, how would that fit into your project timelines? Um, are change control forms utilized? And what's the vetting and approval process for them? And in terms of the specific project goals, will this process flow in the time that you need it to, to happen? Or is an alternative process needed? Change control is so important in terms of the coexisting structure and the foundation of successful leadership. Um, a good change control process affects communication between all the parties. Um, this can be done in email groups for the vetting and sign-off process. And even approved change controls might be shared on a SharePoint for everyone. So that brings us um, over to you, Christy. Great. If you can just pass me the presenter uh, right, and I'll share my screen while we're doing that, and I transfer over to myself. So a reminder, folks, we will open up the session at the end, uh, so if people have questions, feel free to um, write them down now. If you're shy, don't worry. Uh, you, there's a little Q&A in your corner, and you can do that as long as we go. So, Becky, if you can just confirm you can see my screen, and we'll get started. Or Jen, if you can confirm. <laughs> Still don't see your screen, Christy. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start and sort of uh, take off what Becky said and talk about project team roles. So none of these are hard and fast, but uh, you will find that I'm somewhat uh, opinionated. Um, my opinions come from a lot of experience of things that have gone poorly. So when I recommend something, such as the first one on the list, um, find this person. 
if you have questions throughout this or questions of who they are, I'm going to go through them at a high level, um, but I'm happy to talk about that. So if you are doing an optimization program, and I'm going to talk about all the different ways, because uh, as Becky alluded to, it's not just about reducing clicks and big, massive programs. It can be small. Um, but the first person you need to have on board is your executive sponsor. And an executive sponsor, and usually in most organizations, is some leadership position who has a lot of skin in the game to make it successful. Right? They have either said, we need to do this. It could be your COO. It could be your CIO. It could be your director. It could be a CFO. They could be saying, look, doctors are screaming at me all day long. We have to make them happy. Uh, I have people who are leaving. It could be as simple as that. So maybe it's the COO who's driving this. That executive sponsor, in my opinion, is highly um, encouraged. And if you don't have that, you're going to come to impasses within this project that you're going to need people to help with conflict resolution that can't be done throughout the team. You also need, when you've got to take top leadership decisions on how things are going, if they're not going swimmingly, how do you fast correct them, right? You're, you're going to have people who are going to pitch ideas, and someone's got to be the ultimate accountable person of the project. And, and that typically would be an executive sponsor. May you have more than one? You can. I've been in very large organizations where there's been two uh, or three. Uh, just remember, the more you have when accountability shared, it's much harder to really go to the right person unless those are well-defined roles versus a technical and operational type of an example. The next is critical and dear to my heart, and that's a project manager. Um, in this, there's going to be tasks, there's going to be things. Um, I'm going to talk to you about thinking outside the box. It's not just about potentially doing EHR configuration. I'm going to sort of make you and challenge the, the group to think about, hey, do I have the right staff in the right office? Are my MAs being used the way I need? Uh, and do I have technical things that need to happen or interface changes? The project manager's job is to make sure that all the right people are on the team. But most importantly, to manage the project. No executive sponsor is going to sign off, give you a budget, and it be unlimited. Well, if it is, I want your number at the end of this meeting because I'm happy to work for an unlimited budget and that there's no defined timeline. It's got to be a defined timeline. There's too much going on in healthcare today for you to be able to not have a defined timeline and have an idea of how long each one of those tasks take. So that is the job of the project manager to one point to find out if there's roadblocks to mitigate those roadblocks. And clearly, I write lead system analysts. You may have a team of analysts, but it, the best results that I've seen from the optimizations I've participated in or in client communication that I've talked to who may have had someone else do an optimization, you need at least one lead analyst that really understands the full picture of everything that's going to happen and everything's being pitched. Oftentimes, the, the larger or smaller people find their niches, right? I, I might know orders and results super well. I might do a, a knockout notes really well. I might know tasking. I might know the interfaces. I might know I totally get, personally, obviously, because of a clinician, I totally get the flow. I get what the doctors want. This lead analyst really needs to understand that when things get pitched on the table and they're presented and you get options, this person is working with the other teams to sort of develop those options and understands all the downstream effects of each option, right? If I make a flip a switch in one section of this EHR, someone's got to have the wherewithal to understand how that's going to impact the rest of the EHR and be able to see that through. So often I see this as a high-level lead system analyst and that they're making sure that the people who are tasked to do other build work if it's there or to go out to uh, perhaps the doctor's office to inquire, to find out other options for configuration, uh, they're sort of overseeing that team, if you will. And again, if you're real small, and, and you know, I'm hearing that limited resources are there, uh, maybe you're using your analyst and, and that person is going to oversee other people. Maybe you'll outsource and have other analysts doing the work, but someone has to be appointed within the project as the lead system analyst. I'm going to pull in the next three, um, because these three in some ways go together. But if you're going to do an optimization and it is part of a clinic in any way, shape, or form, you have to have a provider or a clinical champion involved. Unless you have a team, and I happen to have one client that their whole entire IT team are nurses, 
even they have physician champions on board. At the end of the day, the people who are using the application day in and day out really need to weigh in. I'm a big proponent to get change control that Becky alluded to. How do you get my behavior to change? When I buy into the fact that, yes, this is the right way, when I get decisions pointed and maybe, you know, I don't like it now, and here's my three options. The minute that I see, yep, you know, I've thought that through, this will work best, it helps with buy-in. And there's going to be that peer-to-peer -peer physician, provider, mid-level, clinical staff, nurses, MAs, that are going to accept that change better when you have a core subset. Call them super users. Uh, if, it, if they're clinical, call them clinical champions, provider champions, that help that peer-to-peer -peer rollout, depending how small or large you go. Because change is difficult, there's no question. And most importantly, if the supervisors and operation managers, if each one of your sites have their own practice managers or if they're responsible for several, they may or may not get the clicks that you're going to talk about. They may or may not get the changes if you're going to do technical or interface, but they totally will get and understand and be on board if you choose to say, I just want to see if I've got the right staff utilization. Do I, is there an optimization program where you just want to see, are there people just sitting around idle in your, in your offices today? You know, I always hear, no, we're swamped out busy. But I've been in offices where, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but some are not. I see Facebook a lot, uh, unless you walk it down. So if you're going to do an optimization, anything with staff utilization or changing the flow of the clinic, and you don't have your oper operations managers or supervisors involved, it'd be critical. They still need to be a part if you're just on the EHR and you're going to affect their end users. Because at the end of the day, who they're, who's going to hear from them first is the supervisor of that clinic. And then lastly, you may need technical, your networking people, your database administrators. If you change your office flow, you need to put routers in different areas. So I I'm, I'm hope I'm talking about optimizations that is a different way than many of you have been thinking about it because that's if you're going to stay in healthcare business, if you're going to be able to change with healthcare direction of where we're going, you've got to think outside the box. Um, if not, the box is going to get you at some point here. I say database administrators because I'm going to give you examples of a client success where we had to have someone who knew SQL, and, and I'll show you why we had to do that. So let's move along and talk about goals. If we get the great team that we want, um, the next thing is to define goals. And those goals have to be at least agreed upon. First rule of thumb is please make them achievable and measurable. Vague statements that come up and uh, that aren't there, such as uh, generic, I want everyone to have, be happy, I want end user satisfaction, that's a subjective measure. The course of my happiness can change throughout the day, day when you ask me. If it's Friday at 5 and I got done my last patient at 3 and I've done all my documentation, I can assure you I might be happy that day. But if it's Friday at 5.30 and I still got three people in the waiting room or my clinical staff was out sick or I'm the clinical staff and there's three other people who were called out that afternoon, that's not a viable me measure for you. And, and oftentimes what drives an optimization from an improvement of workflow, I'm air quoting even though none of you can see me, uh, is a subjective measure of improved satisfaction. So please make them measurable and have agreement. So, you know, when you bring that physician champion to the table and you bring the super users to the table and the person driving this potentially could be an IT director who just wants to make the physicians happier, maybe it's your CFO that says, look, I don't even want to spend any money on this project. So tell me what you're going to do for that. Everyone's going to have competing differences. It may be you have a risk group that's in the thing and says, look, it's got to be about patient outcomes. It's got to be a patient safety. Make them measurable. Those are all great examples that I've been in meetings with and heard. And so how do you do that? Um, find your metrics, make them measurable, and get a benchmark. You, if you don't know where you start, you will never know when you actually can sort of ring the bell and say, I'm successful. And don't wait, make that project manager task the right person to benchmark. If the project manager is the person to do that, then fine, it's that. Uh, but make them benchmark throughout the entire project 
and not just the entire project to say that you're going the right direction because maybe things aren't going right in a certain site. Maybe you pilot something and say, oof, wow, that really didn't make the mark. You've got to change course and change direction. So if you don't have the benchmark at the beginning, if you don't have interim, and most importantly, as Becky alluded to, under the operations of afterwards, don't just make a change, say two weeks later everything's happy, and then walk away. Constant visual is what changes with adoption. That's what drives people to continue that behavior. And lastly, you know, the smaller organizations are on the phone, and, and some of you, I, I know you, uh, I, I know some of you are large and some of you are small, some of you I actually <laughs> work with you. Um, I, I tell you to do a project charter, and it's a simple document. If you've never done it before, uh, you know, happy to sort of guide, but it, in brief, it really puts on paper. Um, I can't say I start twitching when I'm in a meeting and there's nothing documented out of the meeting, but, you know, a project charter really is a living document. You sit down with the project team that you have, you define the scope. Nope, it's not about re reduction of clicks. Maybe we're going to do a clinical documentation improvement optimization, and that's it. And, and I'll reference that in a minute and show you an example. It tells you what the deliverables are, what's going to come out of this, what's, and it's going to list out the objective and goals. I'm going to give you some example of non-measurable and measurables in a minute. It will label who the executive sponsor is. So there's no question on who has the most skin in the game and who is solely accountable for getting the team to be successful. It also tells you who your assigned team resources are. You know, when you start to start a project and all of a sudden you're going to different departments that have no idea what you're even talking about, the likelihood of them helping you and, and doing any work for you is low. When they're most departments, most healthcare organizations are built with functional managers, right? They don't all report to a project manager. They don't report to the executive sponsor under one umbrella. If they did, that, that's awesome, right? You work for me, do it. But it's really easy to do, but that's not how healthcare organizations are set up. To get people to perform and to work and to buy in, it's because you all collectively have some, some end goal in mind. It tells you who the key stakeholders are. So before you do make changes, you know who you've got to communicate to in advance. It's going to identify what those high-level milestones are. And if you've assigned a budget, which the next budgetary person, you, you should have a budget. You should know how much you're spending. And it's not about outsourcing to someone. I'm talking to in-house. If you're going to take a system analyst and they're not going to be done daily, most people would have project-driven projects. Part of their FTE has to be accounted for by hours. So there's some budget, whether there was physical money or not. And lastly, it tells you the business case. Why are you even doing this? What does the business have to gain? You can't prove that the business has something to gain. And oftentimes I'm called to say, look, I need to do this, and I want to do this. What's the business case? Putting that in front so people can say, look, physicians are unhappy. We need to do it. Make that into a business case. So let's give you an example. On the left side of your screen, you should see non-measurable goals that I see all day long. And what I'm asking and sort of putting people to test on is to change them to measurable goals, and this is how you do it. Don't say you're just going to reduce clicks and streamline a provider workflow. Be clear. Find out, say, I'm going to reduce the clicks by 2, 1, or 10 percent, or in my case, I'm saying clicks for time, pick your one and call out which workflow. Don't be vague, make it very clear. So at any time I can measure that. I can go in today and work with Dr. Jones and find out it took him 12 clicks to do his result verification. Or I can find out it took him 10 minutes to reduce his result verification. Then I wanna see and improve my 10%, and I'm just randomly giving you numbers, right? I'm not suggesting that 10% uh, at all by this example, but then I want it to be Right, if it's 10 minutes, I want, it to, I want it to go down to nine minutes because in 40 patients and 40 results, then, all right, I've got, I've, I'm gonna have 40 minutes back in my day, for example. Something that's measurable makes people sign off, makes people willing to participate. Increase provider satisfaction. So um, one of the reasons I'm giving this presentation today is because of the client success where this came directly out of the steering committee. Our providers have to be happier. Well, I've already told you, I can't usually get three providers in a room 
to agree, no alone to admit that they're happy at any given time. And it's too subjective. So I'm going to sort of go into great detail about how this is done, but in this case, Documentation is a clear way that doctors are unhappy, right? They're staying at the clinics way later than they want. They're coming in on Saturdays. They're logging in for home. Show that the time that they leave, almost everything related to the EMR, is timestamped. You can see when they get into servers, depending how you're doing. If you have pictures, you know how many they're logged in. You know when they log in. You can run audit reports. All of these are measurable things so that you can say, you know what? You say you're not happy, but let me just show you, today your notes are all done, or you've not logged in after 6 p.m., and here's the audit report to show it. That way, I can be unhappy today, right? Everyone deserves an unhappy day. The world's not great and joyous all day long every day. If it is, tell me where that is, and I'm, I'm going to move there. Uh, but you can at least say, okay, I understand you're not happy day and that, that really wasn't a great thing to happen, but let me show you, we took real numbers from you uh, a month ago, six months, a year ago, and look at you today. Oh, every provider and clinician in this world, when they were trained, are data-driven. They will never fight a number unless you make it up. And then lastly, increase patient safety and health outcomes. You're going to have to move to this type of measure to stay in the game with value-based care coming. But take that a step further, to do an optimization program, to get it started, to get it launched, to get the budgetary, to get those resources, to be able to move in the direction of the healthcare, put substance behind it, put meat, something that you can get. Maybe you're gonna say you're gonna sign off all electronic lab results and communicate a plan of action to the patient within 24 hours. It's executable, I can do that. I know when results come in, I can run reports to see when they got verified, the t length of time it took. I can see how soon someone did a call patient or mail patient results test. These are all viable options, and clearly no one's going to argue from the CEO down, if you let a result that could potentially be fatal sit in the list for a week, no one's going to argue, even if they're not clinical, that patient safety could not be jeopardized there, because it certainly could if we don't take action, if we didn't know about it. Holding people to a different level and having clear goals. So first is to find your goals, right? Once you've got your goals and you know where you're gonna focus and what you're gonna do, the next thing is to go and implement and make some of those changes. So let's go there. Um, here's what I would see as the top things I've often seen in an optimization program. And this, I, I'm gonna say that this is a standard optimization, how most of you would know it on the phone today. Something within the EHR around configuration. So the first thing people choose to do is, am I going to do a big bang enterprise change, I'm going to go for what Becky referred to as quick wins, I'm going to make it streamlined for everybody, or do you have some real hot spots, specialties or sites um, that you really need to hone into because maybe it's primary care. And there's a lot of dollars out there for primary care providers today. Maybe you need to focus on them to make them more efficient. Um, maybe it is an enterprise change because you have safety issues. Either one of those, the common ones that I would see would be taskless. Everybody wants to have one task view that I can see. I don't have to go to multiple. I don't have to click around. And they want to have one workless view. Well, the way the system was designed, at least in, in, in reference for the folks that are not all scripts on the call, but in many other applications, since I've worked in others, it's not always that easy, right? The EMR companies design certain that they all don't fall in one bucket. And sometimes that doesn't make sense because it may not be the most streamlined workflow. But those are the two areas that I would see that happen a lot. The other is notes, documentation. Um, regardless of the EMR that you're using, how do you make those notes more streamlined? The time it takes to say what I want to say, I, I don't want, I, I'm, you know, many organizations will discourage uh, dictation just because they want discrete data, maybe because they're reporting out on incentive programs where that's not going to fly. So notes is another area. And then clinical desktop views or chart structures. When I say chart structures, I'm referring to how in the chart viewer you would find notes, labs, procedures in your EMR. Clinical desktop views what a dermatology practice may need to see and what a primary care and a pediatrician may see are totally different. I'm a 
huge proponent of standardization because from an IT support perspective, it's way easier for me to pick up the phone and tell you, oh, that's your view because I know what site, what type of rule you are, and that's how I signed it out. When I give each one person the ability to make their own, well, usually they're, that, that's a training that they're not going to get. They're probably not going to know what they didn't know. And I usually don't have the resources to do that in, in the IT department. But there's ways to streamline it so that this specialty, this, this type of role, provider versus clinical staff, if I'm costing a click every time to go and look at vitals, because that's what I want to see, or normative growth charts, and notes aren't my biggest thing, then don't rearrange your clinical desktop view that it makes sense. Maybe that chart structure in very large organizations where everybody's up in one and they use a standard chart structure, maybe I just want to pull out my specialties chart structure in a separate tab. All are viable options. And then lastly, security and roles. Did you build out your system based on roles? Is it easy? Did you take what you knew and didn't really get all the areas that the application could do? Are you utilizing your staff to the highest potential? So if you actually are allowed in some securities, you, you know, you, you can let people do medication refills and it can be a retrospective authorization. You didn't know how to set that up back then. Maybe your optimization is just like that. How do I get my clinical staff to do more and my doctors to do less data entry? All of these are options. So let's walk through an example. I'm going to pick on TASU because that's one of the things I'm going to show you how we made some changes and some, uh, some sort of tips and tricks uh, for you. Um, and again, if, if you're not on Allscripts Touchworks, some of this would be applicable to you, uh, but some of these screenshots are going to be directly out of that application. So again, I talked about um, task views and people often want them in the same view. And I, I think sometimes that really doesn't make sense, and it's sort of having that conversation with the clinical team to make them understand. So typically you put everything as non-delegate. Non-delegate means, you know what, my MA can do that, my front desk staff can do that, my nurse can do that. I only really need to see X, Y, and Z. And that usually breaks down into medications and orders and results versus the things I need to see in my notes signing off of my own notes, potentially see an outside consult that might change the way I deliver care if I see something a consulting physician did, or potentially it's an outside result that doesn't come in electronically. And then normally you would see some task view where if I'm responsible for covering my colleague when they're out, I'd see a coverage. If you don't utilize the document uh, tab for batch sign, uh, consider using it. Why don't you put all of your documents in one? I'm going to give you an example of what was recently done of a client of mine to streamline how they actually um, do batch sign and how they see pathology reports in a certain specialty and outside labs so they didn't impact patient care. And whatever you choose to do, um, please know we've developed a script here at Galen to clean up tasks. Now, there's a lot of nuances to this you've got to consider, but set your users up for success out of the gate. Many organizations, perhaps I brought on a new provider and I set them up and their results started coming in electronically because they were on paper but they weren't using the EMR first. Um, database people can do magic. We do magic here at Galen in this area. So if I have a thousand verified results, please don't expect that I would go in and verify all of those. Give me a clean working slate. If things weren't done well, um, you know, you have senior leadership sign off, they understand all of the um, you know, legalities of what we would be doing in the database. It can be done and it has been done and there's a real viable sense for doing that um, as long as the right people are in the room and understand those ramifications. So here's an example. Um, when I refer to the document tab of that sign, I'm referring to this. So the task list in all scripts uh, will bring in all tasks. My active task gives you all tasks. Um, have people be able to quickly just do certain tasks in different areas. So work list, all their results, verifications done from a work list. Same thing, consider making your notes. If you have doctors, they love visual cues. I'm a very visual, highly visual person. So if I know at the end of the day my schedule needs to have a little note thing on it with a little check mark to say I'm done, I can use that. I, I can work within that context. But if I need to be able to see, maybe I'm in oncology, maybe I'm in OB, and I've got a lot of different um, tasks that are coming in, and I really need to see my patient stuff. In this organization, what was set up was a scanned 
document area where I just brought in pathology. You can personalize this. Maybe I just want to sign all my notes. Maybe I struggle as my own self getting my notes done so I can pull those in. I don't need to see the outside consult notes because mm, it's not going to really impact my care. When I say to standardize, if you're going to build these views, build them out for all and sign out, but please consider giving each provider because some providers are going to work differently. You're going to have people who don't do notes who are going to have to have that area. But if I'm in a specialty where I really need to see incoming paper results that get that need to have be verified, give the users the ability to personalize. And all of this should be considered. So let's talk about the example of a client. Um, so that client um, did thought that task completion was going to help them with patient outcomes, uh, patient satisfaction, and as well as uh, patient safety. So they basically, um, in part of this, in developing their optimization program, um, and, and there was many other things related to this one uh, client success that had a lot of things with massive rollouts and goal lives, et cetera. But they recognized that the time it took to take tasks sort of, sort of carried over in addition to um, uh, satisfaction, but not so much, but basically a big complaint about task time. So what they did was take all the patient-centric tasks that were available. And this is an example, right? Um, the time it took for me to see that result and verify that result, to verify patient results, and then the time it took whoever was deemed appropriate to call the patient with the result or mail the result. And then how quickly did I renew a medication from when it came in? Patients called the pharmacy and said, I need a refill. How quickly am I doing that? Am I impacting patient care by not seeing that, avoiding doing it, and patients miss doses? And then how quickly do I sign my notes? You know, putting everything I need there so if someone else is looking at my note, there's not something really critical that would impact them. Plus, I want to be out of my office in a, in a great way. And then verify docs um, usually are, are those documents come in and that require someone to see them, usually paper results um, that aren't interfaced in. And then follow-ups, this client picked that because they ha would have patient calls where, you know, someone is fielded the call, but the, the provider, the mid-level, the doctor had to go and do that. So they wanted to time stamp that. So what came out of that? How did we develop that? So we developed a, a query. Um, obviously, I'm not giving you that query to stay on the call, but I'm telling you what was in it. We pulled out the task name, right, which was those names on the other uh, screen I just showed you. We got the total count. We, we put in there whether it was delegate or not. That way we knew who was in charge, right? We could go into the task view configuration and look to see who was responsible for it. We looked to see who might have removed their task. No, I'm just not going to do them. <laughs> when they got completed, and out of that, we got the average hour to completion. We took that at the beginning after we sat in steering committees, after we got the team together, everyone defined the goals, we got a baseline, and then every month for one year, we captured that. We accounted for busy times like summer, there were some people out on maternity leave, all of that goes in the aggregate of data analysis. Then over the course, they did their optimization, they made their changes in the task views, they sort of, you know, some people weren't doing certain tasks, so they sort of said, no, you can do this. The outcome of that was an 18% decrease in the total time to complete those tasks. So what's that mean? Because you know what? You want me to say probably everyone got their tasks done at the end of the day. That's not viable. It's not going to ever happen. I could walk out right now and I have a RX Renew task that comes in. What this can be interpreted then, and this is how you present your business cases for optimizations in your organization or where you say, look, let's focus on this, this is real. If you take an example of 20 visits per day, and I know many people are seeing 30 to 60 a day, but let's just take that as an example, because math, I need a calculator in most days. And I have an 18% improvement, I could potentially see three to four patients more a day. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, although every doctor today right now talks about, I have to see more patients that's probably not going to hold true in the next year or two. So I, I give you this as an example, but this could also mean I'm spending more time on some of those quality measures. And the reason I say this doesn't hold true, if you're on the phone and you don't know this, fee for service and seeing more patients isn't going to get you more money in the long run. That's going away. 
in some areas in this country, people are, are that's less than 50% of their day-to-day -day business today. That number is drastically going to increase for everybody in this country, regardless of the specialty. So um, seeing more patients isn't the end-all, be-all, but this if I can see three or four more patients a day, that means I have more time back to do something else. Maybe it's getting on the golf course. Maybe it's uh, reaching out to call and connect with that patient more to get them engaged in their health care. There's a lot of ways that that can be utilized. The next thing we did at this time um, was sign notes. So just as that patient said, uh, provider satisfaction was high on their list, and um, the providers wouldn't come down. Um, the, the executive sponsor said, it's right, they're not happy. So uh, there was a, an agreement amongst the stakeholders that what if we can optimize you and you're not doing work at home, you're not standing at the office, okay? Yeah, uh, because right now I'm telling you I'm, I'm working on the weekends just to get my notes all signed up because you're yelling at me. You can maybe sign, sign note report. So again, we developed a query. We put who the provider was, the document type, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So if you're taking notes, put down document type, the date, so because we did it for a year, I'm going to tell you that too. The total count, how many notes were finalized? So signed and final, locked down, everything's in there. By 6 p.m., presumably that was in this case, um, you know, considered the end of day, and how many were finalized at 10 p.m.? Same way tasking was done. It was gathered at the beginning of the project. It was done monthly for one year. And, and of course, this client has that scope that they can run any time on their own. It wasn't, you know, we might have ran the first time, but, you know, the client runs this themselves now. Optimization took place. The outcome on this was a 16 increase of notes finalized by 6 p.m. Again, I... You know, you've got to take it in context of how many. The numbers were high. In fact, um, if you go to our blog site, you'll see that Becky presented the actual numbers, um, and, and that might be more helpful. Um, but what does this mean? Well, patients are getting better care because if someone else is seeing that patient, all the data is in there. And I'm always going to vote for the patients first, not that I don't care that providers aren't satisfied. Um, but the most important was providers were satisfied. And when you get into a meeting and they say things aren't better, and you show them, you know what, all of your notes are done. You're at like 87% or 90% of your notes before, and now you're like at 89, I mean, I'm sorry, 99. People can't, that's not arguable in a meeting. And we're not taking more comps. So two great outcomes out of that. So things to consider, and I'm, these are real, this, these examples are not necessarily examples from that client success, but real examples and tips and tricks I'm giving you. Think about your system and what it looks like. So when you look at this, and I talked about document types, if you needed to get live, you need to bring a lot of people live quick, you took everything out of the box and just went with it, that's the right thing to have done then. Think whether you need to go back now and change that. Here's another example of, I don't know, I look at this, less is more, often from a provider perspective, I know where to go, I know where to click. Make it easy. Don't make me think too hard when I'm in the EMR. All of you, if I could see you, I hope you'd be shaking your heads and going, oh, my goodness, it, I, I've heard this so often. In this example, what's the difference between the initial consult and office visit note? Make it easy. If clinical staff are open these for doctors, make it easy for them to know which ones. If you didn't configure them any different, meaning the sections that pull in are the exact same and you didn't bring in different forms, eliminate them. That query we ran for that client, I would say, they'd say, oh, no, we use all of them. I have a year's worth of data. I can make that query run for one year. No one has used this note in a year. Let's remove it from this list. So, you know, the larger the organization, people say, oh, I don't know what they're doing. We don't have time to go find out. Let the data, there's things that can be done. Magic, I told you, we have magic gurus that can find this stuff out. So you have that. You, you don't have to go to gathering and ask every doctor if they use these notes. You, you flat out can see if you've never used it. The other thing, and this was another example that, you know, whatever, if this was a, a defect at some point, um, you know, they did not know. In this example, I am a 54-year-old female. I should not see 
any of these health maintenance forms here, if every time my clinical staff or myself have to click here and scroll down to get this, and I primarily am in internal medicine, that's time. That's, that's clicks and time. Now, I still got to click to get to the, the one, but I don't have to scroll down. They just didn't know that they could set this up per specialty. They didn't know they could set it up by gender, and they didn't know they could set it up by age ranges. So some of us, you don't know what you don't know, and I'm hoping that those tips and tricks sort of helped you a little bit there. And then lastly, when we talk about notes, and I talked about um, earlier, um, maybe your optimizations around clinical documentation improvement. For those of you who use all scripts, and you, if you don't use all scripts, touch which you have similar um, templates like this, this is stock delivered, given by the vendor, very clear and straightforward. But this organization really wanted to make it easier. They wanted, their optimization was around ICD-10 that was coming out. They wanted to make sure they did not miss any revenue. So their goal and their whole process was to bring in and streamline those note forms, and that's what they did. They made it easier and simpler to make sure that the doctors hit. They were going to leave, they're going to leave this form still there because doctors don't like things taken away and they know where to click on that one. But the, what they really wanted to do was say, I need an optimization because my doctors, I need to be able to tell them how to find the right diagnosis so that that drops on my charge encounter and they don't get denials and that we're getting all the money we can. But more importantly, that the documentation on what they're submitting on their CPT codes and the associated diagnosis for that support it. So this was a guide, right? If I am putting this, I know I'm gonna to have to take the left serious and acute, and oh, by the way, if they live in a house with a smoker, I can also drop this code in. So that's another example. The last example that I'll give you for this client success story was, and this I've alluded to this a lot, um, I think this is the way healthcare delivery, it will not be about reducing clicks, it will be us rethinking how we do patient visits, and this is one. Um, so, this client sort of struggled a little bit with um, new patient visits. The time it took to get the new patient in, see the doctor, and documented was just decreasing them down tremendously. Um, so ultimately what happened is they really looked at the staffing. They looked at the staffing ratio, the staffing model. They looked at who was doing what during the day. And, you know, they had people who had time. They took that paper form, because that was also, once that paper form was there, they had some people who were manually data entering that, trying to get that all in before the doctor saw them during the new patient visit. Some patients wouldn't fill it out before they got there, and some clinics, they didn't even get it until they showed up. Um, so what they did was take the, and then ultimately some others would scan that paper form in, so then there was a hodgepodge. So what they ended up doing is building a template and, and they even talked about, hey, we're studying these notes in advance to the patient even coming in. And, and this organization has struggled with potential fraud. If they didn't come in, what does that mean? Because we started a note, now we're going to invalidate the note, now we have clutter in our system. So this was not a small feat by any stretch of the imagination. That, you know, I don't want you to think that this is something that's easily executed. It took a lot of time to think about the best way. What they did was build a new template, just a new patient. And they ended up, trying to get those people who had more time that weren't utilized to their maximum potential, start to have that dialogue with the patient before they ever showed up. It made sure patients showed up for their appointments because they remembered. They started to have a rapport and get patient engagement. How many times do meds come in? They don't have their meds left. They don't know their problems. They had the patient, and sometimes it was a phone tag. Sometimes it was multiple calls, but they got the right information. They were going to give better outcomes because they actually knew the doses of the medications. The patient had them in their bottles. We're not bringing all this stuff here and we're trying to put it in the system. And ultimately, they used the patient query to figure out all the patient visits that were one week out. Um, and they started collecting this data. And those people would put in the meds, they put in the history. The outcome of that overall was saving 20 minutes for every new patient visit. Again, Providers were happier because they were spending less time. 
Um, but most importantly, their patient satisfaction, and you could even say their patient safety was improved. A little bit harder to measure, but you can't, you can't argue that 20 minutes of extra time on that visit, um, some way, shape, or form, was probably more valuable time on face-to-face -face than a new patient visit and finding that stuff. So that's really the, the client success options. And again, um, if you have questions and you want to talk about this, we're going to open it up. I'm going to be um, ending soon. But I just want to sort of segue that, um, you know, no one of or a minimum of you actually said it was about uh, finances that, that was limiting you. It's really about limiting resources. Maybe your limitation of resources is because you can't pay for them or you don't have them. So maybe it's financial. What I think that people really need to recognize and be able to communicate well or to be able to metric well against is what it would cost to execute an optimization project may be less than what you would gain out of it. And it's not just provider satisfaction or happy. Maybe you're gaining the retention of that provider and they're not walking away. Um, maybe you get new providers on board that you can because you've got patients you can see, you've got money you can collect, but you don't have enough appointments in the day. So thinking of an optimization pro project not as costing me, but probably gaining me money is one of those ways. And I'm going to tell you your biggest area of focus in the next one to two years is going to be healthcare reform. How do you make your organization better? that you're not about the number of patients per day, but your outcomes are better. If you were testing against meaningful use today, stage one or stage two, and you have primary care, there are viable programs, um, PQRS, PCMH, uh, ACO, all of these could bring you money. I'm going to show you an example of how they can bring you money. Um, and, and the little bit that it may take to just tweak and optimize. And in some cases, this might be more quick. And I know at least one of you has seen this slide before. If you look at regulatory transformation, it's what's driving healthcare transformation in the way we do business today in healthcare. And while that stemmed with our, right, that was really for a recession, but I'm at the High Tech Act and we said everyone's got to use the EMR. When we introduced Meaningful Use Stage 1, we said you had to have a, Get everyone's blood pressure. We know blood pressure is a problem. Heart disease is a problem in this country. And, and we said 50%. And then we said, look, we're going to also track a clinical quality measure. And if, if they have the diagnosis of hypertension, we need that blood pressure to be less than 140 over 90. We need to improve the health care. By the time we hit stage two, we up the ante. And, and we told people we were going to do it. CMS said that. They have review boards all the time. And part of that review board, as you can see, they said, look, it's not two years, it really should be three years, because two years of age, it's, it's not needed. We see that's overkill. And we also changed that it's not hypertension. Hypertension can lead to renal disease. Hypertension can be secondary, but it's essential hypertension. Legitimate hypertension that can be managed by diet, by salt reduction, by exercise, by medications. So we were even honed down to say a certain one. And if you look at the Accountable Care Act, which is on the forefront, and I just talked about PCMH, uh, ACOs, Medical Share State, Medicare Share Savings Plan, and these aren't just Medicare or Medicaid programs. Every commercial insurance has some type of shared savings plan on board today, whether you participate or not, it's a different story. Now, it's not just about the percentage of people who buy screen, but then I'm actually trying to get the patient engaged in getting their goals. Where we're going is more risk-based, value-based. If the patient's outcomes aren't there, you're not going to get paid. It's paid for performance. So if you're not a member of one of these programs, if you don't even know what these programs are, if you don't know if you qualify for that, we can help you with that. I help people all day long with figuring out, can they enroll this? How can we make this workflow work for you so you get that, but you're not inundated more so than what you are today? So, so this is where you need to go. And lastly, it is we have to look at your optimization problems today are not going to just be about um, reducing the number of tasks used. It's great if you do that. I, I really like, you know, instead of seeing 30 or 40 patients today, I, I'd like to think I touch 30 to 40,000 patients depending on the organization and improve their lives. I get that we need to improve patient health care today. 
and, and the challenge is going to be starting, the clock already started ticking, um, making the staff, looking at optimization around staffing, incentive programs, and focusing, it can be as small or as large as you want, but you can start to go down that path to get there. Um, maybe two more clicks. No one wants to hear, gives you more money. Maybe that's what gets you all the incentive money that you need for these other programs. And those are all driven to improve patient care, which is where healthcare and your insurance payment models are gonna be. So that was a gazillion, gazillion things um, uh, that I've covered today. I am going to hand it back to Becky. Um, I do completely appreciate people's time, and I will let Becky take the lead uh, from here. Well, thank you, Christy. That was a really thorough dis discussion. I always enjoy, I always learn something new or hear something new um, when you're speaking. Um, so now that all of you have heard how a frontline customization worked for a client um, and, and how our optimization approach um, really was beneficial, we're gonna go ahead and, and post another poll question. Um, I do, on your screen now, you are going to see our resources. The blog that, that Christy was talking about earlier with our real um, numbers is this one here on the bottom. When it goes out on the public wiki, it just gives you some places where you can really go um, take a look at, at some of our successes. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the poll. Um, so now that you've heard a lot of this information, um, we'd like to know if this is something that you're already doing within your organization. Um, is it something that you'd be interested in, in, in talking about? Maybe you're only somewhat interested or perhaps you're not interested at all. Go ahead and I'm just gonna leave that open for just a few seconds. All right, and all of you have chimed in. Go ahead and close that poll. So um, we here at Galen, we view optimization as the gateway to improving and building cohesive interdepartmental relationships. And at this time, Sin, if you would go ahead and unmute the phones for any live questions that may be on, on the line. All right, you should be good to go. I have a question. This is Julie from Syracuse Orthopedic Specialist. Hi, Christy. Hi, Julie. How are you? <laughs> Good. Um, we are struggling with doctors removing tasks without acting upon them. So we have to, we're manually like tracking the tasks that we send, say we need a note correction so we can bill it. Have, and so we're, right now is we've, we're manually doing that and then we're sending them a second request. We're putting in some financial penalties. Um, around it, but are, with the queries, I can't I can't think of a way to do this. But with the queries, is there any way to kind of identify a task that was removed without being acted upon? Especially if it's like our our billers' tasks are always called review note. Yep. So two things, and and I also see a Q and A in the panel that says, is there step by step instructions on how to set up and run a query? So let me be clear: the query I'm talking about, these are SQL queries. So, um, Julie, I should know who your database administrator is, but um, if you do not know how to do SQL queries, um, so within the works database of SQL, uh, a query can be built for almost anything and everything, because all that data that is entered in the EMR basically falls into database tables. So um, that is something, um, Julie, I'm working directly with you, so we can talk offline. Um, you know, it would be someone writing, it's a, it's a text query and, and actually basically running that in, and then what the output of SQL is, is an Excel. So then you don't have to manually go in and look at views. I mean, clearly you could build a task view if you wanted to be on the user perspective, right? I could build a right, task right. view of all the removed tasks and see that. But if I wanted to um, run a query to have it as a one shop and I don't have to look at all that and put it in an Excel and then you say yeah, you we, need the provider's name. We do that currently. I think we're just going to have to get creative to find out if, I don't know, if, if the note had been edited after the task was generated for that patient 
I just don't want to, I don't want to look at every remove, removed task. I only want to look at removed tasks in which no action was taken. Yeah, and I would say I'm a proponent that no one should be removed. There's, you really should not have removed tasks, um, regardless of the task. Um, that's a poor workflow that has to be corrected in my mind, and I'll tell you why. When you upgrade, over the course of years, it's a little bit better, but oftentimes when you um, consistently have people removing tasks, regardless of what it is, sometimes in the upgrade process, those have all fluttered back um, on the list. So there, there's really not, there's minimal reasons why you should see removed tasks um, ever. Um, you know, they should just be done if they're appropriate or, you know, if you invalidate the note, so there and it was, you know, there's a lot of changes in the database, but particularly on note tests, but removal of tasks, if you had a high number of them, I, I think what I'm hearing is the right track where you, you've got to, you give them a carrot and then you, you've got to at some point introduce yeah, a stick. Yeah, so I think, I know, I know what we're going to have to do. We're, we're definitely going to have to write that report, monitor it, and then attach some financial penalties to it. Yeah. At some time, oh, you, you give up, yeah, you give them the lead way to say 30, 60, 90 days, this is what's coming in 90 days, you, you have to start taking out the stick. Um, for the other question on the run a query, I, I hope I answered that. It is specifically, there's two things. When I said that on the new patient visit, that they did uh, patient queries, they were doing that from the query admin of, in, well, they were looking at their PM, but they were also doing the EHR to see who had pending appointments. So that was being run so that they knew who to go find the new patients are for the week advance. That was done in a combination of the PM and EHR depending on the site and their expertise and comfort level. Most of the queries that I presented to you that said the query name, the task, these are all SQL queries that have been written and executed that can be tailored, right? You can put the timeframes on them, but these are SQL queries in the database directly. Thank you. Great questions or other questions? Don't be shy. Free question and answer. Going once, going twice. <laughs> well, I, I know Becky will formally close this out, but I want to personally thank everyone. Um, again, I always feel honored to be on these calls, but I appreciate everyone's time and um, participation today and, and listening to me squawk and sharing some of my own personal expertise and, and experience and um, great wins. But most importantly, a recent client success that, um, you know, as, as you can see, if you reference the blog, you know, it was over the course of a year. So um, it's working with great clients and changing healthcare that matters, and I appreciate everyone's time myself. So, Becky, it's all yours. Well, Christy, I think you said it perfectly. <laughs> Thank you guys for, for allowing us to share some of our EHR journey with you. Um, and as a reminder that we will have this presentation along with the answers and questions. Um, that were received posted out to our public wiki next week. Thank you.